some babies are born with ambiguity, so we don't actually know whether they are male or female. When my grandfather learned that there was question of, of my sex, it was suggested by him that they just let me die. I look female on the outside. Um, I have normal female body, basically. But instead of having XX chromosomes like a typical female, I have XY chromosomes like a typical male. When I was born, I showed up and I had ambiguous genitals. My mom, who was a nurse, who worked at the hospital where I was born, looked around and she saw all the nurses around the edge of the birthing suite do this. Everyone's dying to know what the baby is and how do you say, we don't really know yet. So how can there be more than simply male and female? I wanted another boy. I wanted a girl. Well, I thought it was going to be a girl. <laughs> I do like it's a girl, but as long as he's healthy, I got bothered. <laughs> I had her as soon as I got in here. Yes, I didn't even get a pair of gloves on today, but we caught her. <laughs> we did. She came in the right place, and she's absolutely beautiful. She's none the worse for it. No. The thrill of a new baby never goes away. No. And the sex of a baby is more often than not the first question everyone asks. The husband said, oh my goodness, it's, it's, a, it's a little boy, and, um, and they were just both, both very emotional. Um, it was lovely, really lovely moment. However, for some parents, it's not that straightforward. They took us in a room and they said, we need to check the sex of your child. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> looking at him and looking at the way he was made, you could, you could actually look at him and in a different light think that he looked like a little girl. Giving birth to a baby whose sex isn't obvious can be frightening and confusing. And most parents would want to protect the identity of their child by remaining anonymous. And I was scared. I was, I was scared for him, and I was scared for us. And I was, I was scared about the effect it was going to have on us as a family. But, but I knew that I owed it to my son to sort it out. How can one day I have a son, and then the next day I, I have to tell all my friends and family that actually I, I haven't got a boy. I've, I've got a girl. We were going to move. We were going to go to America or Australia just, just to get away. Many parents would feel the same shock and fear because sexual ambiguity just doesn't fit with our clear-cut view of male and female. Some little girls who are born actually have male genes and are producing male hormones, but they look like little girls and some Babies who are born look like little boys, but in reality, they have female genes and female internal structures. We've been fed by a tale of two sexes, I think, uh, from generation to generation, so that we think about um, maleness and femaleness as total separate packages that don't meet in the middle, when there is, in fact, huge overlap in terms of different of abilities, of uh, anatomies, and of sexualities. There are about two dozen different conditions that blur the line between male and female. They're known as disorders of sexual development, or DSDs. DSD is a broad range, looking at a spectrum from girls who may appear much more masculine um, uh, initially to boys who are under-masculinized. Uh, and so, and so it, it is really anywhere along that spectrum from femaleness to maleness. Many of the conditions are relatively rare, but some, especially the milder differences, are surprisingly common. In a city like London or New York, as many as 100,000 people will have a DSD of some sort. Altogether, DSDs occur as frequently as twins or red hair. Some DSDs will also affect your general health. 
Janet has a DSD called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH. It means her adrenal glands don't work properly. It's very threatening to, uh, to a body, particularly if there are infections or, uh, or, or some sort of other trauma that happens. You count on your body to react with extra cortisol, and people with adrenal hyperplasia, that's not the way the bodies work. Rather than fighting infections, it ends up collapsing uh, from it. I don't really think that as a child you think about death, but um, I was, I, di I didn't know uh, how close maybe I was sometimes. While Janet's body can't make enough cortisol, it makes too much testosterone. And that led to ambiguous genitals. They just couldn't determine the gender of my parents' baby uh, in the ways that it's normally. It's just such an easy declaration, boy or girl, but it's sometimes not that simple. Male and female genitals actually grow from the same tissue. It's just testosterone that makes them look different. The initial structure the baby has can grow a little bit and become a clitoris, or it can be stimulated by testosterone and grow a lot and become a penis. The same for um, what will become the scrotum in a girl, those that the folds of skin will stay as the labia majora, so the lips of the, the vagina, but in a boy those tissues will grow and fuse and become the scrotum. What it does to a female fetus with CAH is that those high levels of testosterone hormones will mean that she'll start to develop some of the external changes of a male. Because of her CAH, Janet was born with an enlarged clitoris, giving her an appearance somewhere between male and female. I know that there was concern about what kind of life I would have because of the way that my body was. When my grandfather heard that I was a girl that didn't look very much like a girl, um, that, um, and that I was sick, that he suggested to my father that maybe it would be better if I didn't live. That if I couldn't grow up and marry and possibly have children, then really what kind of life could I have? Uh, working as a clinical psychologist and as a certified sex therapist, I worked for a long time with people who were born with ambiguous genitalia, people who we call intersexed. And those people are usually raised with a lot of shame and secrecy. Those babies are hidden from general society. I really understand that experience because that's the way that I was born and that was my experience of growing up. I see a lot of parents uh, go through a tremendous amount of fear and guilt that they're somehow at fault. Um, for having given birth to a child that has a birth difference. I think my parents were worried about that too. There's also a lot of shame and stigma that goes along with having um, a kid that's born different and how do you explain that to people and uh, how do you tell people how it is that this happened. I actually had one parent tell me that she almost wished her child had cancer because at least people have heard of that. So when she needed support, she could say, this is what my child has, and people would know what it meant to say, my child has mixed gonadal dysgenesis. Does it mean anything to them? And trying to explain the ramifications for her child, she just found scary and overwhelming. I think it can be very confusing um, and isolating for families. Um, and the thing that always worries me the most is that that early feeling of shame starts to develop, but that this is something I can't talk about. It has to do with genitalia, and we don't talk about that. Um, so I can't tell my sister, I can't tell my friends at work, um, and everyone's dying to know what the baby is, and how do you say, we don't really know yet. People tend to kind of like uh, create radio silence, and they kind of wait for the doctors to come up with some kind of decision about this. And the doctors are looking at their chromosomes and their gonads and how the tissues respond to various kinds of um, uh, uh, hormonal influences and seeing what's going to happen if they try to give this kid a male assignment or try to give this kid a female assignment. And um, that can be a messy process. Doctors try to work out what happened during the baby's development. 
Among other things, they check the body's DNA containers, the chromosomes, to see whether the child is genetically female or male. They see if the baby has ovaries or testes, and whether they have a womb or not. They also test what hormones the body is producing, and try to determine how the baby's genitals might develop. It's really our um, investigation, almost as detectives, really, an investigation into it and trying to f uh, find out what the external structures are and what the internal structures are. You may end up with testicles with XY chromosomes, but you have a normal female external appearance and you've got a brain that identifies yourself as female. You may end up with ovaries and XX chromosomes and you're identifying though as male. What's more, none of the tests is either or. Each one can be somewhere in between male and female. We can end up with um, all kinds of differences when those things don't all balance out correctly, but generally they balance out in a normal, normal way, a predictable way, and what you get are typically um, females that develop and they turn out as little girls, and males that develop as little males, and that's what we typically see. When we look at the rest of this variance, it's because there's a difference. Determining what all those differences are is what differences in sexual development is all about. What's amazed me the most is that there is such a continuum from the male to the female, and it's really hard to draw a line somewhere neatly in the middle. Nevertheless, a sex has to be written on the birth certificate. So the doctors have no choice but to assign male or female, whichever they and the family believe the child will grow up to identify with best. In Janet's case, that was female. She was born with a womb, ovaries and female genes, even though her genitals and hormones were partly masculinized. The next question her parents faced was whether to allow surgery to make her genitals look more female. At the time, surgery was standard practice, accepted almost without question. My parents really didn't get what was being done. But they agreed because there was a doctor that said, this is the best thing we can do for your child. Really my first memory is of being in a hospital. Very clear memory. What, what is that memory? Um, well, I was about two and um, I can remember exactly where the bed was in the room. I can remember that it was kind of a crib because it had, it had the bars on it. I remember where the door was to the bed and, and how the door had that, um, the glass that's uh, kind of milky. And um, when you used to have exams or the nurses came in, your parents were made to leave the room. And I could see that my parents were very upset. I just knew that it was about being brave. So I started saying, if you hear someone cry, it's not me. And I said that to them every time they had to leave the room. Nobody was looking in my eyes. There was not one resident, not one anyone who said to me, you know, are you okay? Or, or actually looked at me other than to, to lift up the sheets. And I remember thinking, well, if I, can, um, if I can do what they're doing, if I can remove my mind from where my body is, this will be over. I got good at it. And it actually took me months to go to my mom to try and get clarification. Why am I different than other little girls? And um, I just, I kind of remember where she was in the room and in the house. And I can remember saying to her, why am I different than other girls? And it was very sad for her. You know, I just remember her getting really emotional about it. And, um, and I think I was looking for for confirmation from her that everything was okay and that I wasn't all that different. And, um, and I remember, you know, kind of this hoping for, I love you just the way you are and everybody is different and it'll be okay. And what I ended up with was with another surgery pretty quickly. 
It was the third time Janet had had surgery. A lot of the people who come to see me remember being little kids in the hospital. They remember a tremendous amount of pain around their genitals. They remember getting no explanation about what was happening to them, and they know that they still have trouble with their genitalia. My parents and the parents for decades, they really didn't understand. They were told things like, well, um, you know, your child wasn't completely formed in the womb, and we'll take care of that. Or um, this is just a little nothing, it'll all be okay. And what parent wants to be thinking about their children's genitals, you know? They, they don't. So, you know, in medicine, our doctors used to say, this is what you need to do, and we used to say yes. My mom wanted a girl. Uh, she had uh, my older brother first. And uh, like most 50s families, they thought it would be great to have a boy and a girl, and uh, that's not what happened. I had this very mixed presentation where things looked very between male and female. Not really very male or very female at all, but very much in between. It had kind of um, uh, floppy sacs that could have been, uh, you know, uh, testicular sacs or they could have been labia majora. And I had um, a penile structure that was bent down that could have been uh, labia minora or the shaft of the penis. And I had um, uh, kind of a what would have been the head of the penis or the clitoris that was kind of split and put in, put in the wrong place for really either one. And then there was kind of a pouch in between uh, these two uh, sacs that was um, pretty shallow. They called it a vaginal pit. Tiger had severe hyperspadias, a condition that in milder forms affects as many as one in 250 men. The doctors told my mother that it was going to be something they could fix up and could do in a couple of surgeries. I've had 20 surgeries. And first surgery is done at three months. I'm a three-month-old baby. And they're already doing corrective surgery on my genitals. So I'm hardly in the world yet. And they're already bringing out the steel, you know, to cut me up and make me into what they think I should be. From my point of view, all the surgeries that I suffered previous to age 19 were unnecessary failures and I lost a tremendous amount of feeling tissue that I would like to have still and that was taken from me. I would go back to school and I would have a tube running into my body with a sack on my leg underneath my pants that would collect my urine. Right? So I didn't use boys' bathrooms, I didn't use girls' bathrooms. I had to go to the nurse's office or to a faculty bathroom to be able to empty out this sack. So I didn't really have a sense of belonging um, to a sex on the basis of bathroom choice particularly, but also instead of playing baseball or um, some of the other things, or football, that might put my body in, at risk, I would play jacks with the girls or I would jump rope with the girls. So there was this confusion about how masculine am I supposed to be, how feminine am I supposed to be, what rules do I play by, which games do I choose, because the messages were very confusing. Of course, I could never tell anybody what was happening, right? So I always had to keep it a big secret about where I went during the summer, where I went during vacations. So I couldn't tell anybody that I was having surgery down there, where I'm not supposed to talk about it, I'm not supposed to touch. Um, going back and forth to the doctor, which happened all the time, because uh, there were infections and complications and breakdown of, uh, of wounds, all kinds of things happening all the time. I was enduring a lot of pain and a lot of um, really uh, invasive procedures and nasty stuff happening in the office. And my mom had to be there for all that. It was very, very hard on her. And I felt terrible about that. Even as a little kid, I felt like, um, how can I make this easier on her? I think that the weight that she bore was far worse than it should have been. And it's one of the reasons I do the work that I do. I try to reach out to people who are as isolated as she was and uh, get, the, get them the information necessary. On the show today is Dr. Tiger DeVore. He's a sex therapist, a psychologist. We're going to get right to the point. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between men and women? Well, most people think that human beings just come in 
two kinds, men or women, but male and female just represents two sides of a broad spectrum of type. So it's a lot more complex than you might imagine. Oh, very good. Over the past decade, treatment for disorders of sexual development has come a long way. It's far less paternalistic than it used to be, um, and our team as a whole really believes that the whole family needs to be involved from the very beginning. Parents are involved in the very first discussions we have, and we encourage them to continue that conversation over time. The goal of our DSD team is to really take a multi-specialty approach and heavily involving the family uh, with that. And so we have uh, urology, endocrinology, psychology, genetics, uh, uh, social work. So the last I think all of that is very important to treating a child with a complex disorder that requires the expertise of all of those components. This multidisciplinary approach is also used here in the UK. My role is to help parents think about the consequences of early surgery in terms of the fact that, that there'll be scarring, that although it uh, might look m more like they're hoping, it doesn't mean it'll look completely uh, like somebody without ambiguous genitalia because there'll be scar tissue. There's a risk of a loss of sensitivity to that area, um, which is something you know, as a child, they're not going to be worried about, but as an adult, obviously, that's really important for um, intimate relationships. While everyone agrees about being open and inclusive, there's still debate about whether and when to do surgery. There are a lot of activists who describe infant surgery in one word, and they refer to it as mutilation. What parents worry about is bringing up a child as a girl when their genitalia look male and they worry about bullying and teasing um, and swimming and all those sorts of things and and they're very real worries. We know from studies now that uh, with fetal surgery the fetus heals very quickly and, and does very well and uh, infants uh, respond and, uh, to surgery and heal better um, than they do in later childhood and certainly adolescence. For the parents trying to decide what's best for their child is almost impossible. They said in order for him to function as a man, he was going to need, he was going to need intensive surgery, about three to five surgeries, because the way he was at the moment, that was never going to happen. The surgeon told me it was going to look horrific. He said it was going to look like it had been chewed, and that's exactly what it looked like. It looked like a dog had got hold of him. and. It, and at that stage, I thought that there's there's no there's no sexual future for my son. It's impossible. He won't even be able to wee from that, let alone anything else. And I just thought, yeah, we've been told he's a man, but God, he's not going to be able to function as a man. And I was absolutely devastated. The surgeon said, let's go back in that room and let's look at it properly. He said, try and look at it differently. And I did. And he was right. And actually, we're lucky. He used to have surgery, and then we'd come out of the recovery room and go through the children's cancer ward. And, um, and that was a stark reminder. Every time I came through that ward and saw those, those poor little children, that actually, that we're lucky. It, it was the right thing to do. And it, it, it wasn't a question of it was just cosmetic. It was. It wasn't just to look nice, it was because it wasn't, it was, it was to function and I had no choice. Each and every case will always be very different and sometimes there can be compelling reasons to wait before doing surgery. You don't know how a body is going to grow. You know, they, when children are born they can have excess hormones from their mothers so their genitals can be enlarged or engorged anyway. So to wait to wait to see how that child grows, the, what looks to be a large clitoris on a five pound child can look totally different when that child is a year or two. If we look historically at the outcome of surgery that's been performed in infancy for girls with CAH, um, 
approximately 90 to 95 percent require further surgery in adolescence. Unless there's a medical necessity to change the appearance of those genitals, I don't think they should be cut on at all. I think they should be prevented from being cut on. It's the kids' genitals. It's not the parents' genitals. It's not the doctor's genitals. It's the kids' genitals. And when they're a young adult, they're going to want their genitals to work. The issue, I, we, I think we would all want the child to be able to make the decision for themselves. The problem there is that if you wait until they are old enough and mature enough to understand and say yes, ha have you hurt them by not doing the surgery or the medication or whatever earlier? We've had one little girl we worked with with congenital adrenal hyperplasia who had no reconstructive surgery done and now at eight years old um, has a very large seven centimeter clitoris, looks typically male. Um, and when I ask her, you know, how does she see herself? She's like, I don't really know if I'm a boy or a girl. I'm a girl in my head, but I'm a boy below my waist and I don't really know what to do about that. We want to make sure that we're making the proper decisions and, and, and distributing the proper care to the patient for long term. The thing that's most important to me is that we've been honest with families from the beginning, that we've laid out what we know and the limits of that knowledge. Um, and so as long as I feel like we've done that responsibly and carefully, um, I can live with the decisions that we recommend. Slow your roll there, Mom. They're good when they really puff up. I had a premonition that she would be a little girl um, about a month or so before she was born, and so I was pleased that my idea of her was the reality. It's lovely having a boy or a girl, but it was, it was a lot of fun having a little girl. Not all disorders of sexual development are obvious at birth. Many DSDs affect the internal organs and won't be obvious in everyday life. In some cases, they can go undiagnosed for years, which is exactly what happened to Katie. When she was six, she um, slipped in the tub one day and started crying, and we noticed that she had a bulge in her groin, which was a hernia. I remember the hernia. I remember that it hurt. Um, I remember going in for the surgery. I remember lying on the operating room table and being really embarrassed because I was naked in front of all of these strangers. While repairing the hernia, the surgeons were surprised to find a partially descended testicle. They then also discovered Katie had no ovaries and no womb, and that her chromosomes were in fact XY like a typical male. It, it was just a catastrophe. Just trying to cope immediately with the catastrophe was I don't even remember what was going through my mind, just that why had this horrible thing happened to us? You feel like your family is just burdened by this terrible, terrible condition, and, and how are you going to cope with this? Katie's parents found it hard to deal with her condition, despite both of them being doctors. Uh, you're flabbergasted, and as a, as a physician, Everything that we knew about this condition was very, uh, was very abnormal. And so you just say, oh my God, my child is in this abnormal section of the medical textbooks that took up a quarter of one page. And so you're trying to put that in, into context as a parent and physician. And it's really hard. Katie's condition is called androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS. Although not diagnosed until age six, it in fact developed in the womb. In normal fetal development, things actually start off pretty much the same for um, boys and girls as they're developing. It can be a little bit difficult to understand, but if there's a Y chromosome, then the gonad will develop into a testis. The testis produces a number of hormones, the most important of which is testosterone. And it's testosterone that will cause the external genital structures to develop, 
The testis will produce anti-malarian hormone and that stops the female structures from developing. So a male fetus won't have a womb. In the absence of a Y chromosome, the fetus develops ovaries, which don't produce the same levels of testosterone as testes. And it's basically due to these lower levels of testosterone that a baby develops a female body. Now, there are some conditions where things don't work normally. So, for example, in androgen insensitivity syndrome, a child does have a Y chromosome, so uh, an X and a Y chromosome, with testes that are producing male hormones, but the body just doesn't respond in the normal way to those hormones. And so the baby, when born, looks like a normal little girl. I guess I was a girly girl. I always liked wearing dresses. I um, used to sneak in and put on my mom's makeup when she was out and loved dressing up in her clothes. Um, yeah, I was definitely a girly girl. I, lo I loved clothing and makeup and shoes and jewelry and stuff like that from a very young age. As a happy young girl growing up, Katie was unaware of her condition. What we had been taught in medical school was that these women were never to be told of their diagnosis of their chromosomes or that they had testes because it would be so devastating to them that they would commit suicide. What parent is going to convey a piece of information that might uh, lead their kid to hurt themselves? It was a very, very uh, difficult time, a lot of sadness associated with it. But on the flip side, you've got this bubbling uh, six-year-old girl who's, who's happy and she's talented and um, um, lights up a room when she comes in the room. So uh, at the time it just felt like the best thing to do was just keep it to yourself and see how things played out. But deep down Katie's parents felt uncomfortable about keeping silent so they told her a little bit at a time. We started talking about people who are obviously different and that it's okay to be different. I think I told her that most women have a nest inside their bodies um, where a baby can grow and that some girls do not have that nest and that they will be having their families by adoption. It really uh, kind of changed my world and I remember even as like a nine-year-old feeling sad when I saw pregnant women or, um, or even little babies made me, made me feel sad for a long time. Katie's parents knew it would be even harder for her to accept that she had testes and that her chromosomes, her very DNA, was technically male. They didn't feel able to tell her until she was well into her teens. Katie and her sister homecoming? I was very, very angry at my parents. I was incredibly angry because they had known about this for 12 years and my doctors all knew about it, and my grandparents knew about it, and a couple of other people in my family had known about it, and um, like strangers, like doctors who just happened to be in the office when I was there knew more about me than I did. Um, and so I was really, really, really angry with them, and I was really scared. I was not prepared to think about myself as totally and irreversibly different than every other woman. You know, I wondered if, um, if I would ever be loved, if I was so different that I, would, that I couldn't be loved. Katie's testes were removed, and she now has to take pills to give her more appropriate hormones. I think we have very inadequate definitions of what sex is, um, but I think based on what we do have to define sex, I can't say that I'm either male or female in terms of my sex, although my gender identity is very female, so. Being male or female is so much more than just our biology. It's about who we feel we are and how we live our lives. 
And living life with a DSD can become even more challenging when you're starting a relationship. I think it's difficult when you have a body that you know is different, that in that moment of early discovery with someone, that instead of having um, that kind of heady wonderfulness of anticipation, what you feel is fear. I mean, you also feel anticipation, but you have fear, and you just wonder what, when you get to that moment of nakedness, is there going to be reaction? Is there going to be fear? Um, is there, I mean, will somebody go running from the room? And what I've learned is that people don't fall in love with genitals. They fall in love with your soul. And that, that is what people are attracted to. And that's a really important thing for everyone to know. We met in a, a pub in Leeds. As soon as we met, I thought, she's a very nice girl. At <laughs> first, I didn't really think he liked me. He were, he were putting on the charm a bit, but he'd just been on a date with another girl, so I didn't think he were interested <laughs> about me. <laughs> I do remember when, when Jess first came to see me, and it was not an uncommon consultation, really, in that she came not really knowing what was wrong with her. Um, she'd been referred by her GP because she'd not yet started her periods, but she was already 17, so it was a little bit late in the day for her not to be having periods, so I had quite a high suspicion that she probably did have a condition in which the womb doesn't develop, but everything else has developed normally. Jess's condition is called Rokitansky syndrome, and it affects one in 6,000 women. I don't really remember much from what he said that day because I was just in floods of tears. And my mum, I could tell that she was trying to like, sort of hold it together for me. He said that I'd not been born with a womb. We didn't really mention anything about sort of the future. He just wanted to concentrate on getting me through it and letting me know all details and everything. Um, well, this is what it looks like inside the uh, tummy cavity of a woman who does have a womb. We can see here the uterus with a fallopian tube on the left and a fallopian tube on the right and two ovaries. This one looks quite large and that's because it's swollen um, with a structure that's just about to release an egg. But when there isn't a womb, this is what it looks like. So we see an empty space here. Behind we've got the bowel and the front we've got the bladder. Um, you can't actually see ovaries on this picture, but if you look round to the side and a little bit higher up, you'll see here a normal ovary and indeed a fallopian tube. And this nubbin of muscle is actually where the womb started to develop, but actually failed to develop completely. It doesn't change her as a person. I still, you know, we still love each other and stuff. And she's, she's not a different person. It's just a complication that's, that we can move around. I actually had an MRI scan when I first found out so that they could check if I did have both my ovaries as well. Um, and they, it came back that both my ovaries work, so I will be able to have IVF. Until then, there's no point really thinking about it, because what, what we've already, we know what we've already been told, and so... We just, there's nothing we can do exactly, about it Exactly, there's now, nothing. So those are what we're trying to say. There's nothing we can do about it. it, so... And just enjoy life <laughs> together. Yeah. <laughs> Whilst Jess's condition is not normally hereditary, some disorders of sexual development can be. Like Janet's congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So she made careful checks before she tried to get pregnant. Come here, Marley. Hi. Hi, baby. It was wonderful for me to have my children. It meant I wasn't just in solitude, just th thinking and trying to figure it out. I, there was every day we needed to get up and have breakfast and get to school and, um, and just do the things in a daily life that um, 
are, are diversions. Just try to land on your face. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're done. <laughs> the most important thing I could do about um, feeling good about myself was being able to be a really good mom. And it, uh, it just helped me get through the process and the understanding. And I just always feel, felt blessed to, to have the kids. You are fabulous, and I do love you so much. You really did save my life. It's funny, as much as she's been watching me grow, I've been watching her grow out of this woman that felt like she needed to be perceived as, as this amazing mom to actually just being an amazing mom, and not caring who, who thought so or who knew. and Because um, she is. She is an amazing mom, and she's this amazing woman. I think I just got to a point in my life where I realized that there wasn't anything I had done that was my fault, or there wasn't anything that, um, that, that I could claim as, you know, having to be shameful of. I just, I think, got to a point in my life where I was okay with me, and so that whatever I found out about what had happened wasn't going to kind of blow up my life. She's a marvelous daughter. She's a wonderful person. She's a great mother. She uh, learned how to cook from me, so she's a great cook. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, she has a wonderful life, and she's done great things with her life, and will continue to. <laughs> the green household. <laughs> For some women, the reality of living with a DSD will mean they choose to remain very private. In an ideal world, I don't want to be anonymous. I'm not embarrassed about who I am. In fact, quite to the contrary, I'm incredibly proud of who I am. The reason I'm being anonymous is because I'm scared of the outcome. Partial androgen insensitivity syndrome can mean an intersex female with XY chromosomes looks more male at birth. So the doctors wrote male on her birth certificate. I don't doubt my gender. I'm 100% female. But I was born with a DSD. And I was associated, understandably, initially, with a male role. I don't blame anybody for that. It was the level of medical understanding but it was one of the worst times of my life. They raised me as a boy, which was really, really, really tough. When they dressed me, I used to scream and scream and scream. I was ridiculed constantly because of the way I sounded. I was ridiculed because of the way I looked. A really vivid memory that I have was feeling like a 12 or 13 year old girl and being enforced to have to go into the um, the boys changing room and um, my body wasn't anywhere near the state of other people's bodies and I was terrified. By her mid-teens she was experiencing more mixed physical development and appearing more female than male as her puberty progressed. She and her family experienced immense prejudice. It was very hurtful um, f for my daughter, for, for my other children, and for me. The bigotry that they were showing, and the lack of understanding, and their unkindness. And, in fact, she left. She didn't leave the family, but she left the family home to get away from this this type of response, this type of behaviour, um, to the far end of the country. I wish I could refocus that camera and say hello. I really do. And I'm sure I will do one day. Her condition is rare, but recently she's learned a lot more about it and her life is feeling much brighter. I was given the correct specialist to see and clearer understanding of my condition and they're good, they're a great bunch. 
I'm okay. <laughs> I'm all right. I would go to the ends of the earth for all my children. I feel the same way about all of them. Um, and it's just a very deep love I have for them. Do you know the truth is, though, at present in the UK, as a woman who's been born with XY chromosomes, I'm prevented from changing my birth certificate from male. That means that I don't have the right to be married in the way that any other female has the right to marry. I want the same rights that everybody else has. And I'm going to get them. Hi, nice to meet you. At the Houses of Parliament, Lord Stevenson of Balmakara is happy to discuss trying to bring about change. It seems to me that the, the law, when it was first formulated, didn't adequately deal with XY women. And therefore, it should be possible to go back and say, either amend it slightly or add a clause or two to try and make it better. Not terribly easy in, a, in, a, in general terms, because Parliament's stuff full of legislation. But where there's clearly been a failure to, to get the right legislation through, I think people will bend over backwards to help. I have a general interest in, in intersex and other conditions like that. I myself have got hyperspadias in a mild form, and I'm conscious that, that this is not very well known generally. And sometimes there are situations which do need to be attention both on the medical side but also on the legal side. And it just seemed uh, there's a possibility of an injustice being done and we ought to try and act to try and make that remedied. It may take some time, but the wheels are now in motion. I'm constantly humbled by patients' capacities to um, find their own solutions. Um, you know, no one, no matter what kind of history that they've had in terms of the care uh, in relation to their DSD diagnosis, should give up. Patients shouldn't give up and families shouldn't give up and we never give up on any of our patients, no matter what history they come with. I have to tell you, for most of my life, I was a fucking mess. I really was. I mean, I, I, I lived my life and I lived a great life, but psychologically, I just was stuck and I would struggle and I didn't, I mean, I was scared. Um, but I really have had a magnificent 14, 13 years or so. Really, since I got my medical records, since I realized I wasn't the only person like this, it is, um, it's become a fabulous life. Because I'm not a person with a DSD, except when I'm, in, you know, doing this work. I go, I'm, my, I'm a realtor, I'm a mom, I'm, I'm just like an, I'm a normal person. <laughs> From the standpoint of how I would want people to be accepted as intersex individuals, um, the tyranny of being forced into circling M or F on every form that I fill out, I'd like to see that change. Uh, I'd, I'd like to have a lot more options uh, to be able to check. And typically what I do is I circle the whole thing. So it says morph, M or F. And that's my favorite way of responding to that question. When I look in the mirror, I see someone who has come through something challenging and has made a lot of good out of that challenge. I also see someone who likes to read and to sing and to dance and to spend time with my friends. Um, I see a daughter and a sister and a partner. I see someone who um, will be a mother and a grandmother. Um, I mean, I see all of those things before I see someone with a DSG.